Uh, very excited to be here. This is the biggest uh, workshop ever. Um, things have just been going incredibly well. So I'm going to spend a bit of time this morning giving you the state of the union. Realize the previous workshops, we kind of give a lot of technical updates. I'm excited for the sake of everybody to wrap it all together. And I'm going to try to give you an overview of how, where RISC V is now and where it's going. Um, so first of all, Rick, I don't think asked this question. How many of you have never been to a RISC V workshop? This is your first one. Right, okay, yeah, quite a big number. How many of you have never seen me talk about RISC V? <laughs> wow, no, even more, great. Um, so what is RISC V? Some of you may not actually realize, what is this thing? Why am I here? Um, so it's a high quality, license free, royalty free ISA, originally from uh, our group at UC Berkeley, um, standard maintained by a nonprofit RISC V foundation. It's suitable for all types of computing system, everything from microcontrollers to supercomputers. People ask, what is it good for? What's the market? Well, the idea is the spec can let you do anything. Um, it's up to business decision which ones you actually go for. Um, at this point, there are numerous proprietary and open source cores that are just not a RISC-V core. There are many different implementations available. Um, very rapid uptake in both industry and academia. Talk a bit about that. Um, there is a a massively rapidly growing uh, shared software ecosystem, which is really the crown jewel of RISC-V, is the fact there's all this software that will run on implementation you build. Um, and it's a work in progress, right? This is new, very, very new. Things are happening extremely fast. So uh, today I want to talk about the status of things. Um, so what's different about RISC-V? It is just a risk. And in fact, we have tried very hard to make it a pretty boring risk, as in sticking to the original risk principles of being very simple. So what's different about it is it is a risk. It is simple. A lot of things out there called risk are not that simple. Um, so it's far smaller than other commercial ISAs. Uh, it's a clean slate design. We wanted to separate uh, what happens at user level from privilege level. And we wanted to avoid baking in any assumptions about microarchitecture style or technology you're going to build this in because you wanted to be this, to make this very broadly applicable to all kinds of system. Um, and part of that uh, way we achieve that goal is by making it a modular ISA. So there's a base that's mandatory, and then there are optional extensions that are designed to fit together to attack any given application area. Um, and one thing we did was, when we designed this at Berkeley, it was for a research project that was focused on extensibility and specialization. So we wanted to leave a lot of opcode space available for adding extensions, custom extensions. Um, we also wanted to make the base ISA be very small so it didn't interfere with your ability to build a very efficient uh, engine for some tasks. Another big theme is it's stable. So the idea is we kind of freeze each extension and we don't keep iterating and having version 0, 0.1, 0.2, 0.3, 8.1, 8.9, whatever of each ISA blocks. Once we freeze it, it's frozen, doesn't change for all time. And so the base ISA in particular, since we put it out in 2014, nothing's changed. There's been a few loopholes cleared up, but basically that spec has stayed constant. And the idea is that will stay constant. So 50 years from now, you'll be able to download the tool chain and run stuff, the original uh, base ISA. Um, and so the additions are done by these optional modular extensions, not by versioning uh, pieces. Another big difference is it's community designed. So unlike pretty much all the other ISAs, this is being designed by the, the community out there. And what's great is we get to pull in expertise from all over uh, to contribute to the design. So the hope is to make the best thing possible that the whole community can use. So the timeline, looking back at RISC-V, what happened over time. So we started this project in May of 2010. Um, and this was a project at UC Berkeley. We're like, OK, we, we're fed up of hacking on all these commercial ISAs. They have all these IP entanglements. They're too complicated for what we need. Let's do our own one. So we started that in May 2010. Um, the first tape out was actually in 2011 in 28 nanometer FDSOI from ST. Uh, that chip was called Raven 1. Um, at the same time, we also put out the compressed extension, the f very first draft in the form of Andrew Waterman's master's thesis. Um, the first uh, tape out of rocket chip, which you will hear a lot about, it's one of the, that's Berkeley's open source implementation in this Chisel hardware description language. A year later, we did that one. Um, the first Linux port was in 2013. Two undergraduates, Albert Wu and Quan Nguyen, they did, two undergrads came to me, wanted a project. I say, put Linux to RISC V. I was kind of joking. A couple semesters later, they came back, they'd done it. Um, you know, go Bears. We have the best undergrads. Um, uh, then in 2014 is when we really started to see this pull from outside and decided to push it out 
you know, as an open standard that people should go and use. So one key thing we did, and in hindsight, this was a, a master stroke of genius, we didn't, it was that we froze it when we released it. We said, here's the ISA version two, and it's fixed. And we just froze it at that point in time, and basically the same ISA is there now. Um, IMAFD, the um, standard set of extensions. And we also, at Hot Chips, had a big PR push. You saw lots of Berkeley students running around wearing these blue t-shirts. People like, who are these people with these blue t-shirts? What's going on? And that's really when RISC V was pushed out into the commercial world. Um, there was a demand for a workshop. So the first workshop was only less than three years ago, January of 2015. So it's crazy to think how much has happened in less than three years in RISC V land. Um, so the privilege architecture was surprising as I went back and constructed this timeline. We didn't actually put out the spec for the privilege architecture until halfway through 2015, even though we've been working on it for a while. Um, and as Rick mentioned, August 2015, we incorporated the RISC V Foundation. Um, a few more spec updates. The first commercial soft course started appearing in 2016. And the, the first commercial SOC, the thing that's on the badge that I took off for the mic, um, that SOC, that's the first commercial SOC, appeared at the end of 2016 from uh, Sci-5. Um, we froze the privilege architecture. Well, we, we set up a baseline for the privilege architecture, 1.10. And here you are now, uh, seventh workshop. So this is kind of the timeline. And I, I gave up trying to add stuff to the, to the, the, the right of this slide because just too many things have happened in the last couple of years. I'll go through in more detail. Um, but really, this is the progression. So, you know, inside Berkeley until around 2014, 2015, then it started getting pushed out. And now it's kind of a, a worldwide phenomenon. So, what's our goal at this point? Like I keep saying this, this wasn't our original plan. We just wanted something we could work on that was easy to use. But our goal now is to become the industry standard ISA for everything. Um, and we're sort of well along that goal, um, getting there. So how's it going? That's kind of really the theme of uh, my talk this morning, is how are things going? Um, so if you look at industry adoption, the status there is um, large companies are adopting RISC-V for, at least in this one use case, we call minion cores, deeply embedded controllers in their large SOCs. So NVIDIA are public about this. The, all future GPUs are going to use RISC-V from NVIDIA. Um, there are other companies doing the same thing, haven't been announced yet. And this is really replacing their homegrown or other commercial cores in, inside these big SOCs. The other thing is there's definitely awareness across the whole industry, CTOs everywhere. They're at least analyzing, thinking about what they're going to do about RISC-V. So we kind of have you know, the CTO offices everywhere are pondering their RISC-V strategy. Uh, that's definitely the, the status now. One thing we've seen is that RISC-V is basically replacing uh, the second tier ISAs. Um, so what you see is smaller proprietary ISA providers, soft core IP providers, uh, are seeing that, you know, the big market will be there for RISC-V, so they're switching from the proprietary ISA to supporting RISC-V. They'll you know, continue to support their existing ISAs, but they see RISC-V as a new standard they want to be able to uh, support. So Andes, Codacip, Cordis, there's others that will be announcing in this category. And so the message really is, if you are a software, soft core IP provider, you should have a RISC-V product in development. And uh, I'm not qualifying this at all. If you're any soft core IP provider, you should have a RISC-V product in development. Um, that's the clear message. Um, government adoption. Um, so we saw a while ago, India had adopted RISC-V as a national ISA. Um, they've been working hard investing in building their own cores. Um, uh, US government hasn't adopted as a standard, but DARPA is, you know, for example, their recent security call, um, a project led by Linton Salmon, who'll be giving the keynote tomorrow, um, they mandated RISC-V in their recent security uh, program call. Um, the Israel and Innovation Authority has created a new um, uh, initiative, GEMPRO, to develop a platform for their startups in Israel. So they're building a RISC-V-based platform uh, to help their startups in Israel get going. Um, other countries are also looking at RISC-V very seriously. Um, I think the message here is, you know, if your country wishes to control security of its own infrastructure, right, and wants to build up its own semiconductor industry, you better be, you know, working with RISC-V. You want to be involved in and use this thing, all right? So that's the clear message here. Um, startups, very active area for RISC-V. Um, many startups are choosing RISC-V for their product. Uh, the thing is, most of these are going to be stealthy, so you're not going to hear anything for a year or two. Um, and what's interesting to me here is that we haven't had to tell startups about RISC-V. They find out about it very quickly once they go shopping for processor IP, right? There's a um, very, very quickly they, they, they get on the RISC-V bandwagon once they start looking at what would the alternative be? 
uh, commercial ecosystem providers. I think one theme of this workshop is you're going to see uh, a lot of the commercial tool providers supporting RISC V. So, um, you know, people like, uh, I don't want to call anybody particular, but me, Ladderback, Sega, these guys, Micrium, Imperius, they're Ultrasoc, they're supporting RISC V products out there. And the message here is these guys are doing this because there's a demand. So demand is driving supply of these commercial tools, right? So people are doing projects, they need support, and this ecosystem is now filling out with uh, RISC-V-based products. So in academic research, um, it's kind of where RISC-V came from, um, it's really becoming the standard ISA there. There's, you know, quickly, uh, it's, it's an obvious thing for academics to use. It was designed for that. Uh, I'm just going to highlight a couple of talks that'll be uh, at the workshop this, this time, um, the Celerity chip from uh, a few universities working together, over 500 RISC-V cores on an SOC and 16 nanometer FinFET. Uh, also, for my own group, I'll plug this one. This is really cool, I think. Uh, FireSim modeling 1,000 quad-core RISC-V servers in the cloud uh, using FPGAs. Uh, that's pretty cool stuff. So this is just a couple of examples of the RISC-V work going on in academia. Um, one other data point, at the recent uh, Micro 50 in Boston, um, the, we held the, what was the first workshop on computer architecture research using RISC-V, CARV. Um, and this was, interesting to me, this was the largest workshop at the conference, standing room only. And the big data point, this was even bigger than the machine learning workshop, right? So more people, academics, chose to go to the RISC-V workshop than the machine learning tutorial at, at this workshop. Um, and education, um, uh, it's really uh, the top schools are developing the curricula. They're teaching classes. At Berkeley, every level of student is learning RISC-V right now. I'm currently teaching 730 undergrads about RISC-V at Berkeley and CS61C with uh, Randy Katz, my co-teacher. Um, uh, the material is being developed. What usually happens, the way this works, for those who don't know, the top schools develop the curriculum and the slides and stuff, and the other schools copy it. And that's how the material kind of spreads out through the academic space. Um, the really big news here is that um, uh, the, the most popular textbooks, Computer organiz Organization Design, this is uh, Dave Patterson, John Hennessy. This is by far the most popular undergraduate textbook in computer architecture. There's now a RISC V edition. Um, there's also a reader from David Patterson, Andrew Waterburn, which kind of helps. Uh, and this is a useful book for all practitioners coming from other ISAs into RISC V. Those books are out there now. Uh, next month, the graduate textbook from Hennessy and Patterson quantitative approach, that'll come out in a RISC-V edition, based edition, uh, next month, right? So this RISC-V is really spreading throughout all the schools, and what you're going to see is worldwide, not just in the U.S., but worldwide, all undergraduates pretty much are going to be taught RISC-V. In a few years' time, everybody will know RISC-V coming straight out of school, and they're going to come out and wonder why the next product isn't based on RISC-V, right? Um, so uh, this is happening very, very quickly. So. What's really great about all these developments is we're kind of completing this innovation cycle. So, you know, the idea started in research, let's do this nice, simple ISA. Um, one of the goals also was for education. It's simple enough, it's very easy to teach a class with it. Um, but also you have these trained people go out to industry, now they learn about RISC-V, they go build things with it, develop products. And now what's interesting is you can close a loop where you can take industrial problems in these RISC-V systems feed them back as research questions, the research community works on them, and then feeds that back to industry. So previously, there was really difficult to complete this cycle. So it was hard for academic researchers to have real impact on uh, commercial processes because there was this big ISA translation problem and just the sheer complexity of industrial ISAs. But now we can really iterate much, much faster, getting good ideas out into product uh, and back again, getting those industrial problems back into academics to work on. And so really the open ecosystem is the key to keeping this uh, uh, cycle going. So I just want to show this slide because I'm always blown away by how many companies are now actively involved in RISC-V. It really is just amazing, the uptake, and it's really difficult to keep track of the new members and everybody joining and just how much is going on uh, in RISC-V land. So the foundation is really sort of sits at the heart of this ecosystem as the central meeting place for all the participants. Um, and I just present this chart. Again, um, you know, amazing growth. We thought we may get a dozen or so companies doing this, but now, you know, 70 companies and lots of individual members as well. Uh, just incredible. Um, so some of the news we, um, so from, from the foundation, we actually, have, you know, we, one of the key functions of the foundation for its members is umbrella marketing of RISC-V, so make the, make the world safe for RISC-V adoption. 
Um, and we've hired Racepoint Global as a marketing firm to help us with this. And so you've seen, hopefully, improvements on the website. Is our much better news channel, aggregating all the different um, RIS-5 news from everywhere and putting it up there on the website. So we really want to make the RIS-5 website be the central place you go to for all RIS-5 information. Um, uh, and we have a lot of uh, press present. Obviously, as, as industry is more interested, the press gets more interested in covering this. Um, so to give you some idea of upcoming events, uh, next month, uh, there'll be a RIS-5 Tokyo. I'm actually going to be out in Tokyo uh, doing the first Japanese kind of RIS-5 meetup um, out in uh, University of Tokyo, December 18th. Um, there's other events here. I won't go read through them. Um, there's more to come. And what we're seeing is a big demand for RISC-V events everywhere. You know, there's sort of limited bandwidth for all the, the core team to go present everywhere, but even then, spontaneously, RISC-V events are happening all around the globe. Um, all right, so that's kind of the uptake. I want to now sort of dive down and talk more about the technical roadmap uh, for 2017. So one of the key functions of the foundation is to progress the standard, make the ISA improve it, grow it, standardize it, lock it down for people. Um, so back in 2017, we set a bunch of goals at the foundation, technically what we'd like to achieve uh, in 2017. Um, so our primary goals were to kind of standardize the base ISA, kind of formally get that agreed upon. It's been a draft status for a while. Um, settle a lot of the outstanding issues with the memory model, um, uh, with debug, um, and stabilize the privileged architecture for um, Unix platforms and so the people actually working on tape outs that were Unix capable, they'd like the things not to change, to remain compatible going forward. So those, those are our goals for 2017. Um, so I'd say that um, we've made pretty good progress. One of the things in the standardization, we've, we've spent a lot of time fixing corners, holes, ambiguities in the base spec, um, but we haven't quite ratified the standard. And the reason is, if interesting, we're sort of realizing there's this distinction between instruction level specifications and profiles, which are you know, the set of things that software needs to uh, understand to be there uh, when it's running on a given platform. So although this isn't quite standardized, there's actually been no changes to the spec per se, uh, basically relative to the original 2014 spec. We just, um, it's like what form should this uh, standardization take? Is what's delayed this a little bit? But there's no plans to actually change anything. Now, one good thing is the Unix platform has been stable as of Priv 1.10. Um, so 1.10, the, the, the conscious goal of that was from there on, we're creating legacy. So one thing you should say, 2017 was really the start of the legacy for you know, RISC-V. We now, from now on, this stuff has to be supported. Um, and in the Unix platform, the privileged architecture, from 1.10 going forwards, the idea is things will change and we'll have additions, but everything will be backwards compatible to the, to the 1.10. That was the goal. Um, so to dive in a bit more about the ISA specs, um, so when we wrote the original ISA specification, it was, it was almost more of a, uh, a documentary of our design process when we originally wrote the standard. It's not the greatest standards document as a standards document. It wasn't really written that way. Um, uh, over time, we've worked on it over the last seven years, improving it. Um, but one thing we noticed is we, as we saw the range of things people want to do with RISC V, we realized in the original instruction specifications, we had mixed in details about an in, what an instruction should do with various mandates about how that instruction should be used in a platform. Um, and it's difficult to get agreement across a wide range of platforms. If you're building a four kilobyte market controller or a terabyte Unix server, those really have different platform constraints. So what we're now trying to do is factor out the Instruction set specifications, what does an ad do from, you know, must you have vector lengths of 500 in a server or not? So those kind of platform level constraints we're pulling out. And the way to think about this is the instruction set specs are meant to be maximally reusable across lots of different devices and profiles. A profile is meant to be tightly constrained, so software has a clear target um, for that kind of platform. I think I hit the wrong button and it's stuck. Anybody? Power cycle. Power cycle. It has a screw to make it presenter proof. All right. Okay, I'll keep talking. So, yeah, to go over this again, so for example, we have, you know, IMAFD, those are the categories we know and love. Um, 
But in there, there are some constraints that people didn't want to have in all their platforms. And I think we're now trying to make this more general, more usable, but um, not actually, nothing's actually changing in the instruction set specification. We're not saying we're going to redefine anything. We're just repackaging the specs. Um, we think are hopefully a more useful way. Okay. Try now? Okay. All right. As part of this process, what we realized was we need to expand on those single letter names. So those single letter names, you know, IMAFD, et cetera, um, that was kind of, um, we realized that would never be sufficient, but it was kind of, a, it actually worked well as, it was complex enough to get people the idea of a modular ISA, um, uh, but not so complex that people would feel we'd end up with hundreds of things. Whereas in practice, yes, we're going to end up with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different extensions over time. That's part of the goal. Um, so we're going to need more names than 26, right? And so we're going to run out of those someday. Also, the other need as we started to work on the profiles, we realized we're going to need finer grain naming of instruction subsets. Um, for example, you know, some compressed instructions depend on there being floating point or double precision floating point present. So you want to talk about that set of instructions. We don't have a name for that. Um, a lot of people are building implementations that only have multiply and no divide. So they're not actually compatible with M as specified, but you need some way of saying what they do have. Um, and you know, working on crypto, as you'll see later, there's like dozens of potential crypto extensions. They're all going to be, need to be named somehow. right? So the proposal here is we're going to use the Z as the prefix. So Z and something, multi-letter name. Uh, defines a new standard instruction, and X is used for non-standard or custom uh, instructions. That was already there. Okay, so that all, these, all the existing single letter names retain their meaning, we're not changing those. And on the ISA dev list, you see there's been uh, some active discussion of this proposal, just to expand the naming scheme. Um, so profiles are really, uh, there's two kinds of profile. There's one that's what does software expect, and then there's what's in a hardware platform. Um, so the software profiles are really things like ABIs and SBIs. Like an ABI tells a user-level program, what should it, how should it be encoded, what can it do, and what's the result of those operations. Um, so those are, uh, we've sort of been working on this sort of to the side, but realizing this is really, when you talk about compliance of a system, you want to make sure that some piece of binary software you run works well. So that's the goal of the profile. What can that um, software assume uh, for an ABI or an SBI? Right? That's really what we need to standardize. Um, also, down at the platform level, for things like an M-mode-only microcontroller, what can it assume in there? So if you actually have portable libraries, you want to have portable libraries in M-mode, what can you assume there? And things like debugger support and, and so on. So basically, you see these two kind of profiles, software-based and uh, defining the platform, and things like how you boot up. So the instruction specs are common across all these different profiles, where they are using those profiles. Um, but this is going to be a chunk of work, so that's what we're going to be working on. Um, 2018, and hope to get the first few out uh, the first quarter next year of this. And so also the compatibility suites, compliance suites will be relative to these profiles, right? So actually, one, one big point there is the compatibility suite, in order to be able to run it, you would need to assume some things about the environment, right? So this is sort of realization as we're working on the, the standardization. Another big topic is the memory model. So those of you even watching the the memory model, uh, the raging discussions and the press and the resolution of all that. Um, one thing that's been uh, incredible to see is that, you know, given that the original model was too weak and um, was underspecified in the original document, um, we've just had amazing input from a lot of experts. And this is really the power of this open ISA. We can get the whole community, the best people in the world who really understand this stuff, to come together and work on uh, a, a, common, a common standard. Uh, this has just been incredible. Uh, really, top people have spent, you know, many, many hours in very, very detailed meetings. They make your head spin. You know, I, I'm, you know, I know a bit about architecture, but this stuff, you know, makes my head spin too. Um, and we have a resolution. So um, the good news is there is agreement. Uh, people understand, and uh, it's not just agreement. We have. Um, so the agreement is that the base ISA model, memory model is this weakly ordered model. We call RISC V weak memory order. RVWMO. Um, the nice thing is we have detailed formal specs of what that is. Um, there's a few little details still being worked out, but those are really in the corners. A large set of this is all agreed upon. What's nice is you have both an axiomatic and operational definition that meet for this memory model. Um, and we have mappings from C11 constructs to the base, I say, and also when you have the A extension added in. So how you map those constructs down to the base uh, memory model. Now the other 
uh, thing that became clear as we're doing this was there's a very strong community who feels that these weak memory models are really a disaster um, in, for the whole industry. Like, these were forced upon us by architects plugging processes into memory systems and then seeing what happened. Um, and that really is, uh, that's actually a pretty accurate description of what happened. Um, so, um, RISC V, we want to make a, you know, support a community who wants simpler designs, simpler memory models, also things that are easier to validate and be more secure, maybe. Um, so, we also defined TSO, total store order, as an optional extension on top of the base. So, when you think about it, the base ISA is this weak memory ordering, which we need to support because a lot of systems are being attached to existing memory systems. People want to build high performance, simpler cores. Uh, the weak memory ordering makes that easier to do. Um, but as a community is interested in strong models, and so we're going to support that as an extension. The extension basically restricts the uh, possible behaviors of the memory system. Um, and so then the way to think about it, any machine that's TSO can run all the code that's weak. So all the weak code will run compatibly on a TSO system. It's just the TSO system can declare that it only has TSO orderings. Um, and so it has much simpler the memory model. So Daniel. We'll, from NVIDIA, we'll talk a lot more about that in his talk uh, later this morning. But the good news is we have an agreement. This is the resolution. Um, and I think it's amazing, uh, just incredible. I just want to thank the whole group for, you know, I know it was very, very hard work and very, very difficult arguments, discussions, but we have a lot of progress there. That's fantastic. Um, the ABI and compilers. Um, so the um, Common Convention ABI, as part of the upstream process, has been stabilized, documented. Um, the great news is GCC and binutils upstream and release. GCC 7.1, RISC V is now a mainline architecture. LLV upstream has been accepted to be upstream, and that's in progress. Uh, I want to point out the companies in participating here. So this is the community building these things. So Sci-5 and Andes for the GCC port, and uh, Lorisk and Andes for the LLVM support. There's a bunch of other compilers and languages that have been ported to RISC V. CompCert is the certified C compiler. Um, a bunch of other languages. The one hole here, and this is a place where it would be good to have some more help, is uh, a, a, a JIT for Java. We have interpreted Java, the open JDK running, but we don't have compiled, uh, uh, sorry, a JIT version of the Java. That would be good to get. That would need some significant push from somebody to get that up on RISC V. Uh, the Unix platform, uh, we talked about 110. That was released at the last workshop. And the idea is everything will be backwards compatible with 110 in the privileged architecture. So the big news is Linux was accepted, uh, RISC V Linux accepted for upstream in 4.15. So Linux has merged this in. Um, it'll be released uh, 4.15. Um, that's great news. Uh, BSD has been mainlined since 11.0. Um, one of the big news is we have the hypervisor spec now has been released. Um, they call out to John Hauser sitting at the back, who's a big contributor there. Uh, hypervisor, also Paolo Bonzini uh, from the KVM maintainer contributed a lot of ideas that went into that. Um, so, and it's designed to support recursive virtualization using an enhanced S mode. Um, so I encourage you to go read that spec. We've had little feedback on it. Either everybody thinks it's fine as is, or they haven't had time to read it yet. Uh, but Andrew will be talking about next, the next talk. Um, a lot of other OS ports. There's a long list of various ports are there, uh, either in progress or completed already. Um, pick your favorite OS. Um, the debugger, there's been a good collaboration amongst a lot of companies. Um, and we have a stable version that we're just waiting to go through ratification. Um, this is already being targeted by the commercial ecosystem partners. So that seems to be going pretty well. Um, so 2017, I would say that summary is all the planned major technical decisions got settled. Uh, a little bit more work needed on the actual ratification process and actually formally uh, proving those things. But the actual, everybody's agreed on the technical uh, uh, content of these, these components. So that's good news. Um, so what are we going to do for 2018? So get that ratification done, get the standard written in a way everybody can agree on for the instruction set specifications and the platform profiles. Um, work on the vector extensions. Um, get those proposed ratified. Hypervisor, one thing with the hypervisor, we do not want to freeze on that standard until we've actually implemented it. So get the hypervisor implemented um, and get the, the spec ratified. You know, focusing on KVM as a primary target, but also interested in you know, Beehive and Zen. Uh, make sure a few different hypervisors get to use those extensions. Um, we also like to get the formal spec, which has been going on through 2017, get that completed and released, at least for the base instructions uh, as well. So these are our goals for 2018. Um, so I won't spend long on here. The vector extensions is a whole talk by Roger coming tomorrow on this. 
Um, but this is something that had a lot of interest because we view this as where RISC-V is going to really um, you know, shine in areas such as machine learning, DSP, graphics, supercomputing. The idea is we come with a very powerful vector ISA that's going to replace other ISAs, ISAs packed SIMD extensions. Uh, there's been a lot of movement on the design, a lot of active progress. It's been getting simpler, which is good. Uh, one thing that's been added, though, is the notion of shapes. So in the vector unit, we support scalars and vectors, which you might expect, but also matrices, 2D matrices. Um, and this is uh, designed to give you high efficiency on certain kinds of codes, specifically you know, linear algebra kind of operations that are at the heart of all the machine learning uh, work that's going on, uh, DSP as well. And the crypto is going to build on top of wide scalars in the, the vector unit. Um, and the goal is really to be the best vector ISA ever um, trademarked, right? So you'll see the talk tomorrow by Roger on this. Uh, security. So we've been working on this. There's really been two separate efforts in the foundation that kind of bundle into one group. There's the trusted execution environments and then the cryptographic extensions. Um, but one thing to realize at RISC-V, there's been a huge amount of work. It be it's become a very popular platform for security architecture work. I think primarily because it's simple and open, and those are very important attributes for security. Um, you know, proprietary closed systems don't tend to be secure. You need something that gets inspected um, by experts. So there's a lot of work and the community on here. Um, Everybody agrees security is really important, but you know, from my perspective, nobody knows what the right thing is. There's a lot of like, point ideas that seem to work, but uh, the, really this is not, I think this is very active work in progress across the whole industry, not just in risk pipeline. Like what should be the right things that are done here? Um, some other random stuff we have input on. So with interrupts and risk five, uh, so far we really have two categories, fast local interrupts, global platform interrupts. Um, we're seeing input for people would like. So one thing about this community, we're driven by you know, the membership demands. What do people want to see? And as you know, enough people come forward and say we'd like X, Y, Z, we'll try and you know, meet that demand by putting together groups from the membership to work on this. So some requests I'm seeing are basically two extra types of interrupts, what they like to see. For high-end systems with a lot of cores and complex devices, uh, we'd like to see message signal interrupts supported better, more directly. Currently, they're routed through the PLIC. Um, Really, this has to be developed alongside the hypervisor support. So these things actually get, uh, need to work. That's why partly we didn't do this earlier. We realize it's going to interact with the hypervisor, so we want to get this uh, hypervisor settled first. Um, on low-end embedded, some activity on the mailing list, but we, this is something we've known about for a while. People are interested. When you have very slow cores and very dumb devices, uh, low-end systems, you know, basically programmable state machine level systems, you would like to have some kind of preemptive vector interrupts. Uh, one goal here is they shouldn't disturb the existing schemes. So we have some ideas here. There's been some mailing list traffic. Uh, you'll see some more uh, on this as we go forward. Um, one other thing was improving embedded compression. So the C extension was developed to support general purpose computing, meaning you know, big, relatively big programs compiled, you know, C compilers running on uh, regular platforms. Um, what we're seeing is we're getting some feedback from members that you know, in some embedded workloads, the compression is not as competitive as they would like. Um, and so, uh, you know, one hypothesis is we haven't had time to look at this in depth is due to byte and half word memory access is not being compressed, maybe some other instructions. So one alternative we'd be considering is whether we add a, we, we change the C extension when it's built on top of RV32E systems, which is the, the 16 register version. There's a lot more space in there actually to do more. Um, so this is something that please come talk to me about this area. I know. I've talked to a few people. This is something that people view as a need to improve the compression even further uh, for some embedded workloads. So we'd like to work on this. Um, one thing that's been created recently is the J extension. And this is a new task group to work on um, support for dynamically translated languages. So things like JVM, uh, JavaScript. You know, some of the issues they're dealing with, how can we handle integer overflow? This was consciously omitted from the base ISA. I still think that was the right call. But these languages need support for it. Somehow, it's not clear the best way to support it. Uh, also, how do you support garbage collection? How and if do you support garbage collection? How and if do you improve instruction cache management for these jitted languages that generate code dynamically on the fly frequently? How do you handle that? Um, so, the technical priorities for 2018, um, ratifying the base ISA, number one, the profiles, getting the compliance suites done, um, implementing the hypervisor to try out the spec, Getting the base vector spec, which is a subset of all the things you imagine doing, and some implementations up so we can evaluate it. Our goal is really to, we want to implement things before we freeze them. Um, uh, work on the trusted execution environment some more, get some specs and some implementations, and on the crypto support as well, and get the formal model done for the, at least the base ISA. 
One thing I should say, the formal group has been making a lot of progress. There's agreed upon, they've all agreed on the standard notation now for expressing the formal model. Previously, we had lots of formal models in different languages. Now they're going to work together on a single format. So other priorities, I would say, not the, the main things, but I think you'll see activity is on the various interrupt support, improving compression, uh, tracing. So we, we have run halt debug. People are also interested in uh, non-intrusive tracing support as well on systems, um, and also the J extension. Okay. All right. To summarize, you know, this current the way you know I remember at the the second workshop at Berkeley, you know, my advice to people was, you know, if you need a product in the next six months or a year, you should go buy a commercial core. If your product is a year away, you should work on RISC V. Uh, now I'm saying the current system is very usable for commercial development. You should just go use it and for simpler Unix cases as well. There's a lot of soft core providers. There's a lot of support in the ecosystem. If your product is a year out, the thing you need will probably be done by that time, <laughs> the way uh, rapid development's been happening. So by the time you decide to do your project, the support's gonna be there. So um, one thing is there's, you know, there's a lot of silicon projects in the pipeline, but there's still no Unix-capable RISC-V SOC for sale. You know, that hopefully will change in a few months, but right now there isn't one. Um, and really, you know, the goal is you guys should join the community and help push this along, because I think it's been a great boon to lots of people. Um, so it's doing a good thing. So we don't have time for questions in the regular talks, but I, uh, this one I thought would be worth having a few minutes. Uh, I think we have five minutes left uh, for questions. So at that point, I just stopped and take questions. Yep. Just a question. Say, uh, talk about what's the right baseline for developing, say, on a Unix system, software apps that would be the most portable? I mean, you didn't really mention that. All right, the question was, what would be the right baseline for having software apps on a Unix system? So that would be the, you know, the ABI for a Unix platform. That's already there. If you look in the Linux port that's upstream, that defines the ABI for those Unix ports. And that would be GC, like the including the, so the, the standard Unix ports, we decided that C is mandatory in the, the standard Unix profiles. Yeah, so GC would be the ISA things, and the ABI is defined in the Linux port that's upstream now. Logging, yeah. like tracing? Yeah, that's one of the, like I said, that's one of the things we focus the debug support so far on run halt debug, but there is a lot of interest in tracing, and that's, um, I think, a topic for this 2018, uh, set up a group to work on that, uh, to work on tracing. There is some, uh, for example, you know, one of the members, Ultrasoc, they have a uh, tracing support they've announced supporting multiple companies, risk five cores. Uh, I think that's an active area for the 2018. Yep. Hello? How much commercial demand exists for an OpenJDK port, roughly? Uh, sorry, the question was how much commercial demand is there for a Java JDK port? Was that the question? Yeah. Um, uh, not enough to have somebody step up and do the work. Um, I, think, uh, I think there is interest in having that. Um, I don't know where that, so again, this is a community-driven ISA. If nobody wants stuff, it's not gonna happen, and that's fine. If people want stuff, they have to step up and make it happen. Um, so I'd say at this point, there is, there's interest in different groups from doing it, but not enough to push, uh, push it to high top priorities for people. I'm just pointing out as one area where there's a hole, right? There's, a, there's an obvious hole there, right? All right. No questions. Wow. Well, this is definitely the quietest workshop if it's the biggest one. <laughs> Okay, then I'm going to, oh, Rick, you have a question? Um, I have a question on the, the memory model. Okay. Uh, you give a little more detail on the SDK So the memory model, one thing, there'll be a whole talk in a few, two, two from now, we'll go into excruciating detail about the memory model. Um, I would say that, but, but to repeat this sort of high level um, points, so weak memory models are incredibly complicated. Anything weaker than TSO is just, you know, even the experts get confused on memory model design. Uh, what's been amazing is that we've had a, a, a great team of people, a lot of the well-renowned experts in this field, working in the task group, laying out the specs, going through all the holes, formally specifying it, and they have agreement and formal specs, both as an operational model and as an axiomatic model uh, on the RISC-V weak memory ordering model. Um, but you know, part of the insight is from doing this process is, you know what, this is really complicated. A lot of software in some situations might prefer just a, 
have TSO, and we should support platforms that can declare that they are only TSO. Um, but the baseline is the weak model. There's a lot of implementation issues that mean you cannot support TSO efficiently. So you need to, or you, there's a penalty, power performance area penalty supporting TSO, or you're injecting it to a system that it'll be just too difficult to add TSO support to your core. Um, and so that's why weak memory model is the base. We think any core can support weak, the weak model. TSO will be like a sort of premium feature, if you like, of some cores. They'll announce that they only support, um, they only have those orderings in TSO. So it'll be easier to um, bring code over. Yep, Tommy. Any validation Yeah, so actually there's uh, some of the groups, like uh, there are different groups that have uh, litmus checkers and um, like uh, uh, Peter Sewell's group out of Cambridge, they have you know, some litmus checkers for these different memory models. They'll, they'll report, so you can run these dynamically on a piece of hardware and to find if there's any violations. Um, there's also, again, we have a formal spec, so if you have a formal group, they can work with that to check your implementation against the spec, right? So I think the important thing is to capture the rules in the spec precisely in the formal, formal case. Then we'll also have these litmus checkers, but they're also, you know, they're not exhaustive, obviously. They're just dynamic checkers, right? Yep. Kevin? Do you have any, uh, does the foundation have any formal way of addressing IP challenges? the foundation have any formal way of addressing IP challenges? Yeah, I think this is, um, we, we had initial st steps here in terms of the base ISA, you know, at, at least putting up a genealogy. We showed all the prior art for the instructions. We believe at the ISA level so far, um, you know, it's, the prior art is way, you know, way past patent expiration dates. Um, this is something we need to you know, continue to work on at the foundation. I think people would like not just the ISA, but also reference implementations to be patent unencumbered, and they should be. This risk stuff goes back a long time. Um, even for relatively complex microarchitectures. That's an activity the foundation could put more effort into, I think. But at least at this point, um, you know, we're not aware of any challenges in the, at least in the ISA space. Obviously in microarchitecture, there can be infinite number of patents and that's, that nothing will change with RISC-V versus any other core that you have. But, right. but at least at the ISA level, we think we're reasonably safe so far. Okay. Okay, last question. Uh, yeah, I, I want to ask, uh, are there any new instructions for a, a, a new uh, uh, extension, and for example, the J extension? So uh, it, 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 it means that we design new instruction to perform, uh, uh, for example, the garbage collection or something like this? Yeah, the goal, so the, the way that RISC-V works is we, we decide that there's a need, area need, the membership decides there's an area need, and they, we form a task group, present a proposal on, you know, for example, what are the new instructions we need to support dynamic languages better? They prepare a proposal, it goes up for a vote. And the thing to realize with RISC-V is none of these extensions are mandatory, right? If a profile decides, yes, say in the future we realize J is so important that every Unix platform should have it, there'll be a profile saying, you know, there should be, you know, GCJ will be mandatory for, you know, this, this class of Unix systems. And that's the way we'd add it. But the important thing to realize is like the base I instructions will always be enough to run all the standard tools. You don't have to implement these extensions. They'll be available and standardized. So everybody uses it, uses the same thing. So you get all the leverage of the entire software ecosystem targeting the same instructions for garbage collection, uh, for example. Right. Yep. Okay. That's time. All right. So I'm done.